Hey, Comics Cubers. We launched season two of the Comics Cube with an interview with Mark Russell for Superman Space Age. And we are ending season two of the Comics Cube with an interview with both Mark Russell and Mike Allred, the writer artist team behind Superman Space Age, and out this week, Batman Dark Age. Come join us. Welcome back to the Comics Cube, everyone. I am with the writer artist team of Mark Russell and Mike Allred. And we're talking Batman the Dark Age. How are you guys? Great. Fantastic. Before we start, I just want to say we are recording this on Mark's birthday. Happy birthday, Mark. Happy thank birthday, you. Mark. Oh, thank you so much. I want there's no one I'd rather spend my birthday with than, than you all. We <laughs> believe it. <laughs> all of you uh, up there in comic book land. How do you guys uh how did you guys meet? And did you already well, like were you already drawn to each other's work before you even met? Well, I was drawn to Mike's work for a long time because like I what I thought about when I thought about comics wasn't really big two comics. What I thought about when I thought about comics for like decades was like sort of 90s indie comics. Things things like Madman and you know, too much coffee man and uh, uh Life in Hell. These are these were comics to me. You know, uh, flaming carrot, a and uh, so I, I, you know, admired his work for a long time, uh, and always been one of my favorite comic book artists. Uh, so when I finally got a chance to sort of, you know, suggest comic book artists for a really big project, which you know, Superman Space Age at the time was the biggest thing I'd ever had approved. So they said, we don't want you to think, you know, strategically. We don't want you to think about who you might be able to get. We want you to think in terms of who you want to absolutely want to get, like bucket list. Who would you want to do the art on this? And Brittany, our editor, said, you make your list. I'll make my list and we'll come back and compare notes. And Mike was the guy at the top of both of our lists. So, Mark, I, to I, me, this is like a yeah, miracle yeah. that you ever get your first choice. Mark, I, I think, um, you know, you mentioned that. 90s indie comics i think that madman mike's work is a great bridge between the 90s indie comics and superhero comics specifically because madman kind of does follow superhero tropes uh yeah but it also very feels much like a, a 90s indie comic no i i would much rather have read that than pretty much any big two superhero comics that were out around the same time M mike were you drawn to mark's work prior to you working together oh, yeah I loved what he had been, uh, what he'd done with Shannon Wheeler, and um, of course his Hanna Barbera DC stuff. That was that was super cool. I liked. Um, I, I like did a Booster Gold cover. Oh, you did a Booster Gold cover. Yeah, and yeah. I also did a, a cover for his uh, Lone Rangers, a uh, Lone Lone Rangers, Lone the Lone Ranger. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the thing about Mark's work for me, Mike, that resonates with yours, I think, is like I told you yesterday. Uh, in our in our last interview that I think regardless of who you're working with or whether you're writing for yourself, I feel like your art style and your work has always led itself to more introspective thought. And I think Mark's work is full of that. Absolutely. And of course, yeah, I think one of the things that really drew me to, to Mike's art initially was the fact that like the characters all seem even, you know, no matter what's happening, no matter how goofy it is or how cosmic it is, they all seem like real people. They all seem seem to have really meaningful internal lives that you can see on their faces. That's something that is probably the most important thing I look for in an artist. I think one of the things about Mike's work, uh, Mark, is that I, you know, reading the Superman Madman crossover Hula Baloo from the '90s, it was amidst all of the silliness, the body swapping, the Mister Mixes Pitalikin the ness of it uh the twister game uh there is all of a sudden out of nowhere like a discussion about whether or not they both believe in god it's like whoa that's something um i always thought that was uh very interesting which i think again mark is reflected in a lot of your work you do talk a lot about that kind of stuff about faith yeah i mean i think that comics is like sort of the perfect medium to talk about things that you could never get approved in like say like a network tv show or, you know, you, if you tried to make this into a movie with a big budget, you'd have uh, focus groups shooting you down and executives looking over your shoulder, trying to see how you're going to waste their $30 million or whatever. In comics, 
uh, both because the team of people who are working on it are smaller and because the, 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 the you're not using as much of other people's money. It, it's like, you can tell the, you can tell these kinds of stories. You can tell, you can talk about things. You can get away with talking about things. You couldn't necessarily get away with talking about another visual mediums. To me, it's what really makes comics worthwhile in a lot of ways, the best visual medium there is. You both live in Portland. Did you actually meet each other before working on Space Age? I well, actually, I live in Portland. Yeah, I live in Eugene, which is about an hour and a half south. It's uh, the University of Oregon. Which oh. is where I grew up. So we do have the, the Eugene connection. Yeah. You guys bond over that? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, uh, first time we met, I, I went down and stayed with Mike for a few days down at his place. And we just sort of hung out in Eugene and walked around and talked about places and things. We, we did the animal house tour. Yeah. yeah, he did the animal house. Tour. <laughs> There's no longer an animal house, but you can still do the tour. Yeah. And uh, Mike, what what did you feel uh, when you got the assignment for, when you got the call to get Space Age, Superman Space Age? A dream come true. I mean, it's it's so definitive. Uh, uh, it's one thing to get to work on, you know, major iconic characters. It's another thing to be tasked to show his entire life. It, it's uh, um, it, it's huge. Does it ever lose its luster? You've drawn Superman before, like drawing Superman again. Does it ever? Uh... Oh, n never. I've I've never felt like I was working on a character that lost its luster. i i I'm always able to muster up great enthusiasm for anything I'm working on. That which is why I'll work on what I'm working on. But again, in this case, it wasn't like, oh, here's a Superman story. It is the Superman story. And we got to uh, tell, I mean, of course, it's very familiar. There are certain milestones that are very familiar. But I think uh, through Mark's filter and hopefully through mine, it's very fresh and just it has a really nice energy to it. No, it's very different. I, I think I've told Mark this. Um, it, is a, it is a work that it's not something that I really expected like at any point in time when I was reading the story, because I mean, spoilers for anyone who hasn't read it. Uh, when I read a Superman story, I kind of expect a happy ending where, you know, he lives and saves the day. And in this particular case, you're telling a story about one of the earths in the multiverse that doesn't survive the crisis on infinite earths. Spoiler. <laughs> I feel like it is sort of a happy ending, but, but not necessarily for him, you know? which I think is okay for Superman. Yeah. That, that's I, think, okay. I think Superman sees this as a, as a win. Plus there's another Superman who got a happy ending. So Very it's, much a, so. it's a net win. I think win. Superman sees himself more as like part of something bigger than himself. And, and so he, he takes the fact that he won't be there for, to be at the victory party. I think better than most of us would. Uh, Mark, we, we talked about, we, Mike and I talked in our last interview about um, how much he loves talking, I mean, how much he thinks about existence and existentialism. Um, and then within Superman Space Age, you do, you do tackle that particular, you know, uh, theme uh, regarding whether or not if we transfer our brains into something else, is it still us, etc. Um, is that something that came out of your discussions with Mike or... Was it always going to be part of your story? Well, it's, I think it's something that comes out of my discussions with everyone. I think it's something that, you know, it's just on my mind. And I feel like the the fundamental philosophical problems of who we are and what we should be doing, I think, are permeate a lot, like, like a lot of my conversations with people and a lot of my thoughts. And I, I think that it is, it is, it is like um, a good premise for a superhero story to be to be exploring that the, the idea that you are the most powerful being in the world and yet even you cannot save it even that comes with an expiration date at some point all of this will be futile and it will end with uh end with your failure so how do you find meaning in that? which i think is ultimately the existential question that confronts us all where do we find meaning knowing that the, that ultimately our, you know, our hearts will give you have a finite amount of time on earth mike how, how do you how do you go about depicting something you know uh depicting things like existential questions etc and still making it look like a vibrant comics page i don't know 
<laughs> Honestly, we're gonna say it was Laura. <laughs> well, actually, w even with Laura, everything now is very instinctual. I, I, uh, you know, there's a script. I process it, and then it, then it just flows. And um, one thing, the the most consistent thing in my entire career is I always strive to make what I'm working on the best thing I've ever done. It's it's what keeps me going. It 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 what it inspires me. It um, it keeps me energized and focused. And um, but I don't really at this point, you know, I I'm comfortable with my tools. I'm comfortable with my process and um, I lean on my instincts as much as possible. I've asked both of you, you know, about existentialism, about your thoughts about um, just living in general, but I've also asked both of you about your specific religious journeys is it, which are different, but I feel like they're very similar. Um, is that something that you guys have bonded over and discussed? We haven't really talked a lot about religious backgrounds. I think we're aware of them, but I think that, you know, I, in a lot of ways, uh, it's the religious presence that, that we talk about, the religion being storytelling, being, you know, finding meaning in the universe through telling stories that we can use to connect to other people. But yeah, I, I, feel, I feel like that's more like what we've sort of talked about and bonded over is what these characters mean and what we can, we can uh, make them mean. But I feel like in a lot of ways, that's my religion now is storytelling religion is, uh, is the need for uh for for mental uh for for mental sort of exercises that will allow us to figure out things that are otherwise too painful to discuss and that's the role that stories and art play in our lives yeah our our religious upbringing certainly um are are a part of who we are I've found over the years that most creative people, whether it's film or music or comics, most creative people push past their religious upbringings and are constantly seeking and constantly, you know, answering more or asking more questions. And um, so it's really easy to stereotype somebody, whether they're raised Jewish or Protestant or, you know, Muslim or Mormon. And um, what I've found in most cases is that's really narrow and everyone I've met and discussed faith with are well, well beyond um, what could be thought of as stereotypes or, you know, perceptions and misperceptions. And so what I've learned over my life is how we should all be respected and enjoyed as individuals and not try to shove people into little boxes based on where they came from or how they were raised or what faith they were, they were instructed in. Um, and because of that, I, I feel like I have a better understanding of this thing we call the human race. <laughs> in I think that my personal yeah. Turing test would be, you know, if an artificial intelligence is alive, if it can, reject the programming you're giving it and make its own decisions about what it values. And I feel like that's sort of also my Turing test for human beings. You know, you're a real intelligence, you're a real uh, living, functioning uh, soul if you're capable of rejecting your original programming and, and, and creating your own set of orders. And I think that's what Mike is talking about and what we all do. It's like we start at all different places. And we might end up in all different places, but the fact that we're growing and sort of changing on our own volition, making it up in a way that makes sense to ourselves proves, I think that's, that's, those are the people I feel a kinship to, not necessarily the people who think exactly like I do or feel like I do, but the people who I feel like we're growing like I am and trying to figure it out what it is they should be doing on this planet. I think there's a lot of uh, subversion in what we do too, uh, which I get a big kick out of. Um, we bring people into uh, this comic book genre, superhero genre, and, um, you know, that's our Trojan horse. We, we Here we are with, uh, hey, kids, we're going to take you on this costumed adventure. And um, 
but then there's so much in there that is constantly provoking thought that uh, hopefully people get way more out of it than they were expecting. Don't you think like Mark's work is like that in general? Like Snaggle Puss won like uh, an award for best comedy series, and I'm like, Snaggle Puss isn't a funny comic. But that's a great example. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's like you think you're going to get this, and you get that, but so much more. And then ultimately, hopefully, you're a much better person for it. <laughs> <laughs> the other one, Mark, is I like not to as, just as a reader. I like to like open a book open a comic or watch a movie or whatever, not knowing if this is going to be the one that changes my life, you know, and I, I've had that experience so many times where I'm expecting nothing of this movie. I'm expecting nothing. Oh, it's called they live. What, how, how smart could it possibly be? You know? <laughs> and then you're blown away when it turns out like, this is brilliant. Yeah. And I, I feel like in a lot of ways, that's what I aspire to write. The one thing people that might change somebody's life that they did not see coming. No. Yeah. So, they, they live is like, um, it does blow your mind, but you know, if you came in it for a 10 minute fight scene in an alleyway, well, you still got that. Yeah. Most by people way, come in thinking, oh, way, it's going to be watching Roddy Piper beat up some aliens, you know. Fellow Oregonian, by the way. We mm -hmm. actually, uh, Lauren, I met him. We, uh, I met him once. On, yeah. We're on a flight with him from uh, Chicago to Portland once. He was a cool guy. Rowdy yeah, Roddy I Piper? Once, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, uh, he used to do a, like a, like a radio show out of a, out of a, um, like a diner that was, uh, down the street from where I lived. And sometimes I'd go in there and I'd see him and I, you know, I talked to him after his, his radio show. Yeah. He was really approachable and cool. Yeah. Very oh, sweet. Oh, wow. That's really cool. I, I was a big Roddy Piper fan when I was younger. So, <laughs> um, in Superman Space Age, you had a specific take on Batman. And one of the things, one of the things that uh, makes me say like this is such a different thing that I'm used to is I'm used to like an uh, you know an Elseworld story about Batman absolutely showing his origin, and then you did not do that in Superman Space Age. I'm assuming you're going to do that for Batman: The Dark Age, um, and you also set him against Lex Luthor, as opposed to Lex Luthor being superman's arch enemy you know the battle of the billionaires <laughs> yeah uh, what, what what prompted that particular decision uh to put those two against each other well i think when you're writing uh when you get a chance to rewrite a character from scratch and tell the story from the beginning over it allows you to sort of rethink things not necessarily be trapped in by what's come before and one of the questions um that 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 i had in writing this one you know i kept it just felt weird that his arch nemesis would be this 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 terrestrial billionaire who you know i think in, in, if there was such a person as superman that would be kind of beneath their contempt and they would really be focused on you know the extraterrestrial threats the people like brainiac and you know the anti-monitor that would be something worthy of them wasting their their efforts and and lex luther would be sort of like a uh, you know a, 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 a like a like a dachshund who barks at you when you walk up to the front door of somebody else's house. And also I, it felt like, like from Lex Luthor's perspective, uh, Bruce Wayne would make be a much better adversary because they're, they're both competing for the, basically the same thing. And, and that's what, what really makes Lex Luthor tick the, the uh, idea of being the richest man in the world and equating wealth with power. And so it really felt to me more like like Lex Luthor would be more interested in bringing down uh, Bruce Wayne than he would be in, in Superman, who he sees is not even playing the same game. It's like imagining, you know, Wayne Gretzky ha having a rivalry with Michael Jordan. You know, they it's like, oh, they wouldn't really be competitors. Mike, uh, did this is the most, shall I say, animated version of Lex I've ever seen in a comic or maybe even ever, uh, did you pattern like his gestures and, you know, facial expressions after anyone? No. <laughs> okay. No, like, um, I, I'll get a script from Mark and I'm excited how fresh and again, thought provoking. That's what, that's the phrase that keeps coming to mind. And I know that if, unless I just completely fail, people are going to find as as entertaining as I am reading it initially. And um, again, just falling on instincts, it, it the, the words in the script 
animate it for me. And, and that's what spills out onto the page. The first question I'm going to ask about Batman, the dark age that I think is on everybody's mind is, is this the same Batman as the one in Superman? Is it the same space Batman age? as the Superman space age? Yeah. No, it's, it's a similar Batman, but this is a different universe, but it's a different universe. It's one of the, also, also one of the universes that is destroyed in the, by the, the anti-monitor in the crisis on infinite earths. So it's a similar Batman, but it's not the same Batman in, in Superman space age. Okay. What are the similarities between this and Superman space? Is there a Superman in this universe, for example? Yes. And the Superman is preoccupied with kind of the same thing. He, you know, he will ultimately find out that, you know, when Brainiac comes to Earth, that that anti-monitor is going to destroy the universe and he needs Batman's help. But Batman is so fixated on saving Gotham, which is being torn apart uh, in, you know, not in no small part by his, his own company, by Wayne Enterprises, that he feels like he can do the most good by focusing on 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 Gotham, but Superman says there's no point in saving Gotham if the rest of the universe dissolves into cosmic dust. So we got to have all all hands on ship. And at some point, it becomes a question of uh, of what you know priorities to Batman. Like what does he does he value the thing he's cared about his whole life, and that his like parents like both died for. Or, you know, or does he sacrifice that for the greater good? And I think that's a question that gnaws on on Bruce Wayne his entire life. It's like, to what extent is he willing to sacrifice everything else for Gotham? I, I want to stress that this ending must be protected, too. It, this, uh, this ending is such a kick. And um, anybody that reads it should completely protect it and let everybody enjoy the 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 grand finale um but this also being a different batman it, that also frees me up artistically because what was fun with superman space age was going through the decades and constantly tweaking things so batman is constantly upgrading his gear constantly trying to make his suit work better and so i'm able to constantly change the design and whatnot and now with this I can even do even more of that. <laughs> so there will there'll be similarities, but also some uh, nice little tweaks and, and fun little, uh, uh, you know, differences that, that uh, will keep people on their toes. Does he get more and more mechanical as each issue goes on, Mike? I would say no. Okay. I would say he become, he's more and more comfortable in his own skin. That's what, how I read it. Okay, the, the trigger point for Superman Space Age was the Kennedy assassination. Is there a similar trigger point for Batman the Dark Age? Well, there's ob an obvious trigger point for Batman the Dark Age, which is obviously his parents being murdered, uh, which kind of sends his entire life in, into a tailspin. And that's, I think, I can give away without really being much of a spoiler alert. It's kind of central to the Batman mythos. But I think secondary only to that is the fact that he uh, gets sent to Vietnam to avoid prison time as a youth and that's where he sort of learns how to become batman as working as like a commando behind enemy lines in the vietnam war and it sort of colors him and his conflict throughout the rest of the series because he sees himself as like sort of a uh, a guerrilla warrior uh behind enemy lines at all times it's brilliant and it's a classic example of um something that how fresh this take is but at the same time, once it uh, once you move past that, it's like, well, of course that's what happened. It's like it feels so natural. It feels like that should be part of his history. I love it. The Superman Space Age was three oversized issues that, for some reason, were not black label issues. Um, Batman: The Dark Age is a six issue miniseries. Why the change in same, format? Same same page count. I just get to do more covers this way. Oh really? Yeah. So it's six oversized issues. Yeah, it'll be the same same exact. The book will be the same exact length as Superman Space Age. Oh, okay. The big difference was that we wanted to break it into six issues so that people could read it at more regular intervals, and also, you know, it, the one sort of feedback we got from people from from customers when we did the three books was that ten bucks was a little steep for one issue, even though 
value wise, it's actually, you're actually getting more for your money. You're getting 80 pages, basically four comics for $10. I understand that when you're going in the comic book shop and you've only got a 20 in your pocket or whatever, putting half of it on one comic can be a bit daunting. So we, we wanted to do um, six issues that were, you know, five bucks instead. And then the collection will be the exact same size on your shelf. <laughs> what uh, can you talk to me about uh, additional, you know, themes that you're tackling in batman the dark age that may be similar to what you've tackled in space age uh and themes that are unique to batman uh, in this yeah i story. think one of the very similar themes is what it means to be a hero what it means to uh to um care about something other than yourself and I, you know there's a there's a passage where you know he bat where bruce wayne obviously influenced by his father talks about how at some point you uh like growing up is realizing there's something in the world more important than yourself and at some point you come from that which you go from that which needs to be protected to that which is protecting and that's what you know growing up and becoming batman means to him it's about becoming the sort of person his father taught him to be which is like somebody who ultimately is is a shield to those who aren't protected by the law and a sword against those against for you know who are who are beyond any sort of um, justice. Uh, and um, in the super, in Superman Space Age, there was a whole thing about the trolley problem, and it sounds like this is going to be much the same thing, Mark. Yeah, I'm not bringing back the actual, they're not, not discussing the trolley problem but in, in Batman Dark Age, but it is very, I think there's a lot of philosophical sort of internal and external debate in this series. Can I ask you guys where you stand on the trolley problem? Personally? <laughs> Whatever Mark says. <laughs> um, well, you know, there are variations to the trolley problem. And, um, and you know, the, 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 the basic one, uh, you know, if you, uh, I think most people, including myself, would say, well, yes, you should change the uh, the track to save the, mo the largest number of people. But then the follow-up question is, well, what if you had to push somebody onto the track to stop the train instead of pulling the lever would you do it then and at that point most people's answers change and say no i wouldn't do that because it's not really about what's right in the end it's about what feels right in the end. and so to me the whole problem sort of exposes how our ethics are really not don't exist in this sort of perfect platonian sphere of you know logic they're really ultimately about us and what we feel is right and so i feel like um you can't really answer a question like the trolley problem until you're in the situation. Exactly. But the, be the best thing you could do is to explore yourself ethically, to ask yourself questions about what's right or wrong and to try to become a better person each day so that when you are faced with these problems that probably won't be nearly as predictable as the trolley problem, you may not know what to do, but you will be a better person making that decision at that moment. And I feel like that's what I feel we should be doing that's my answer is that ethically we should just work on becoming better people all the time so that when we're blindsided by this decision that we have to make in a split second out of nowhere and it's not time to go to debate class or you know uh google famous philosophers opinions on this we will make a better decision than we would have if we have just been content with being jerks our whole lives yeah and given any daily circumstance would determine what kind of decision you might make you might make a completely different decision yesterday or tomorrow it just based on um everything that's in your present in the in the foreground of your mind so which i think is very much aligned with what superman says is that like well you just want to remain the kind of person who will try to save everybody yes yeah. it's, it's not so much about the outcome of this particular instance it's about the outcome of a lifetime of you making decisions about other people's lives and and you have to remain the kind of person who values everybody yeah Take i love I love the way Batman answers it, which is basically like, you just want to spite the person who put you in that position. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it's very can, much about playing defense against evil. Uh, can you talk to me about uh, who can we expect to see in Batman the Dark Age? Villains, uh, sidekicks, Justice Leaguers. Okay, I will I will um, tease you a little bit. And I, and I haven't seen some of these villains yet because Mike's still drawing the scenes in which they show up, but I'm so looking forward to it. 
Uh, but you will obviously you'll get the Joker at some point. Uh, you will get uh, Penguin and Riddler, but one of the ones I'm kind of most excited for is uh, Mad Hatter as like sort of this Charles Manson figure who like runs like a family of like sort of hippies and, and manages to sort of recruit Barbara Gordon <laughs> in, into like his sort of family. And that's one of the things I'm sort of, I haven't seen it in the art yet, but I'm one of the things I'm most looking forward to. I know you can't talk about the rest of that, so I'm not going to ask about it. But now, <laughs> color me very intrigued. Uh, Mike, who are you having the most fun drawing in this series and reinventing? Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Batman is probably my all-time favorite character. Uh, yeah, he's, he's up there, man. What well, you, you you know my three Bs, so it's two uh, of them are behind you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I would be surprised I, that there was a Beatles video game by the way. The pinball game, by the way. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, yeah, so so aside from Batman though, like uh, do you have a favorite Batman villain that you're uh, enjoying drawing right now? Uh, I love them all. It, it, should I start listing my favorite children? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I don't I I it's it's whoever I'm working on at the time, seriously. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then when we're talking about Batman the Dark Age, a uh, six issue miniseries launches on uh, on March 26th, Tuesday. Um, and how, what is the, what is the pressure? Is there any pressure at all? Like trying to, knowing that there's a whole log of like evergreen Batman stories that DC is constantly reprinting, the Dark Knight Returns. Uh, I Batman feel like one, you know, I, I've seen the first two issues in their entirety, and, and I don't think there's anything in currently in the Batman versus anything like these. So I don't feel the pressure from comparison. I just feel the pressure from I hope really people really like these. I hope people really respond to these, so they'll keep letting us make more. But I was I was just floored by the way the first two issues have turned out, and and, um, and I and I, I just can't wait for people to see them, and I hope they really like them. And like I said, I honestly think it's the best thing I've ever done. And um, I'm super excited for people to see it. I'm just, I love getting up every day, getting to play with it. And um, I also like Superman Space Age. I believe these are evergreen. These are, it, it, I think these are when people are like, hey, tell me what Superman story I should read or tell me what Batman story I should read. I hope this, these will be the ones that, that get shoved in front of people's faces this is what you want you get it all right here mike you've worked on several versions of batman over the years um and i think you know you've also worked on several versions of superman over the years but uh the thing that i hear uh, um the most about these two particular characters batman in particular is just how adaptable uh they are and how they can be morphed and molded into whatever story that you're trying to tell, whatever tone you're trying to tell. Uh, do you find that Batman is, in fact, a more um, malleable character than Superman when it comes to uh, whatever story you're trying to tell? I think he's more complex. Um, but I also think, I mean, that's the challenge with writing any, uh, uh, you know, working with any established character it's you know how do you how do you form it how do you alter it how how malle malleable actually is it that's the challenge and so I, I, it's hard for me to say that one is more so than another but um with superman and batman they have characteristics that are so ingrained in us be, after decades and decades of existence that we have certain expectations and it's fun to give people the satisfaction of living up to those expectations, but at the same time, spinning it, twisting it, tripping it, you know, and uh, uh, making it fresh all over again. And it's ever exciting. So uh, I, I hope I, that answered your question. <laughs> Mark, would you agree? Would you think, would you say Batman is a more complex character than Superman? Yeah, I think so. And I think that to me, the, the difference is really th that um, Superman starts from a good place, and that is he comes. He's a he's a person who comes to Earth with n nothing, 
but uh, the people who love him. And that sets him out on on a, the, the path to greatness. Whereas Batman, somebody who starts out with everything, and is born to billionaires and loving parents, and then they're all they're murdered and everything sort of goes to hell right away. And he's somebody who has to crawl his way out from darkness. And to me, that's it, it, yeah, that's the difference. But it means that he is, I think, much more psychologically and uh, emotionally complex, probably than, than Superman. I mean, I love Superman, but I think that the com- it's a it's a very different story you're telling when you're telling the story of Batman. And in some ways, I would argue that Batman is more heroic than Superman because because of those challenges. He he, he at least he doesn't have to worry about money, but the psychological complexities uh, and again crawling out of darkness that's a much greater task. Um, and and he does it so. Uh, and also, we, we, you always hear about how Batman is more identifiable because he's just a guy, you know. He he he's a self-made hero. He he nurtures his skills and um, takes advantage of his wealth, certainly. But he doesn't buy his skills. He he earns them. Like uh, Mark revealed earlier, how he has to uh, do some time in Vietnam to avoid prison time. And a lot of his uh, mojo is built there. I, I f- yeah, he is by no means somebody who uh, sort of has it easy or you know buys his power in in this story. And I think in most Batman iterations, he's somebody who, who despite being born with everything, has to earn every every ounce of respect and and uh, redemption he gets. I feel like with with all due respect to anyone who has ever tried telling this particular story is like every time people have tried to make Superman a more dark and psychologically complex character, it's always kind of really fallen short. It's just I don't think he's built for it. And no, I, I think, think it kind it's... of misses the point of what's interesting about Superman. And what's interesting about Superman is very different than what's interesting about Batman. And, uh, you know, Superman's sort of a, uh, a thought experiment for our best selves. He shouldn't, shouldn't be dark. He shouldn't be, you know, troubled and or you know, uh, uh, edgy. He should be somebody who is like uh, what we would be if we were better people. I believe that's why he retains his popularity because he's somebody that we can lean on. He's somebody that he's he's uh, you know he doesn't drop the ball. You know that he's going to give it his best and always on the sunny side of things. An optimist. And that's a, a reason why I love him. It's like uh, you you want to have somebody in your life that you can uh, lean on the way you can lean on Superman. I guess that brings me to my next question, which is, does Superman in Batman the Dark Age have as much airtime as Batman in Superman Space Age? No. And I think part of the reason for it is not that I didn't want to give him more. I mean, I would, I, I love, he's one of, probably my favorite character to write in the DC Universe. But it, there's just so much story to tell with Batman. There's such a uh, an ensemble cast of characters that it's just hard to find the room to to tell them. Uh, you really have to make some hard choices about what makes it in and what doesn't. And if he's in the same spot as he was in in Superman Space Age, w- would it have been just kind of retreading that particular ground, Mark? Yeah, and I think that's part of it too. Is that you know a lot? I mean, there, a lot of it is. Um, you know, the uh, assuming that people maybe are familiar with Superman Space Age, there's a lot of things that don't we don't necessarily need to go over again, or we could just sort of allude to. Uh, it, and plus, we didn't want the premise to be exactly like that of Superman Space Age, so that's kind of in the background. But the focus in, in Batman is is on very different matters than what you got in Superman Space Age, even though in the background the clock is still ticking on this universe. Mike, you talked about uh, evolving looks over time, but let me ask you about Gotham City. Uh, what's it like drawing Gotham City and how that evolves over time? Well, in this case, the, uh, again, super fresh take t- take on this is with Thomas Wayne and, and his ambitions to build a beautiful Gotham, a city of tomorrow, which is on the first cover of the series. And uh, because of his death, it fails. So there's a, a nice contrast right out of the box with that. And uh, the, the pages I'm actually working on now show uh, have a really great action sequence in that abandoned city of tomorrow. So the first two issues are done. 
uh, the first the first issue is coming out March twenty sixth. It's going to come out monthly. Um, Mike, uh, you you're working on issue three at the moment. I'm assuming. I'm almost, I'm, I'm like a week away from being done with three. It's awesome. So okay. So the and then Laura's doing the colors, of course. Beautifully. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, okay. Say, uh, getting the colored pages is like uh, what I imagine a 14th century peasant would have felt like walking into like a cathedral, seeing the stained <laughs> glass. It's like, wow. <laughs> I was telling Mike yesterday. Oh, uh, did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> I was telling Mike yesterday, the first time I ever saw his work, I thought like, oh, this is great art, but it's so much better when it's colored. <laughs> Um, True that. Very, yeah. uh, you you will have variant covers um, by oh, man. Yeah, Yannick Paquette and Frank Whiteley. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now here, because again, it's six issues instead of three. Like I said, I get to do more covers, but we also get more variant covers. And wow, people are bringing it. Uh, Paul Pope, Dave Johnson, Kevin Nolan. Uh, the uh, Frank Whiteley one was released this week. Uh this is killer stuff. It, they're all just fantastic. The so Frank Whiteley yeah. one looks great. Like I, it doesn't. It looks so different from his usual work. Frank's, uh, Vince. yeah, Frank's, Frank's White, Frank Whiteley's. Yeah, yeah, I, I told him like with my Batman, I like him to have actual, actual ears that look like a bat. Original and... bat, original Batman ears. I was gonna ask yeah, you what your favorite that. Batman costume was. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but I played with it. You know, like we've he, we've had his ears look like radio antennas and whatnot. But but uh, when he's wanting to, you know, represent this bat silhouette, I love the the big ears. And and so I told Ben that, and and he ran with it. Mark, you have a favorite Batman costume? Batman look? Uh, I think my favorite one was the of all time was the one that like uh, like Mike. First, had Batman show up in in the uh, the Superman Space Age because it looked at once raw but sort of like futuristic. It's like totally what I could see like like a Batman and sort of the uh, the the space race nineteen sixties wearing. Uh, and and uh, to me that was it was just the coolest thing seeing that that costume. It, to me, it just fit perfectly with like this is like something if you'd have. Frank Gary or somebody design a Batman costume in the sixties. It, it probably would have so would have looked something like that. So Mark, uh, Mike, you mentioned yesterday um, that you you had plans past Batman: The Dark Age. Um, Mark, would you like to comment on those plans? Yeah, well, I think our plans were always to do this as a trilogy. You know, to end with like a, a Wonder Woman. Uh, book in the same sort of vein as Superman Space Age and Batman Dark Age. But recently we've been talking about doing even more than that, like maybe creating our own sort of pocket DC universe where we, you know, do volumes on like other characters, other popular characters, like doing a Flash or a Green Lantern volume uh, after this one. So it's something we're talking about right now. And a red for sure, but... volume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh... No, the, idea, the idea being that each each series focuses on a different Earth that gets destroyed in the crisis. Yeah, the idea, the, the basic concept being the same, but through the line, the eyes of a different hero or entity. It is interesting that it took basically forty years for anybody to say, "Hey, let's look at all of these infinite Earths." The, I think are... because the whole point of the crisis on infinite Earths was to stop people from doing that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's been 40 years but the beauty of what we're doing is they're self-contained they stand on their own right and and again that's why i hope they'll always be uh, examples of work that would be a great way to introduce anybody to any of these characters okay uh my last question for you guys is aside from the dc stuff are you two talking about doing anything other anything else together well i think this is i mean i would always be open to doing anything with with mike and laura but uh i think this is a, a consuming enough of our time that <laughs> it's hard to imagine it's hard to imagine mike working on two projects at once uh me or anyone else um i don't know but i would definitely be open to it oh i i, I love everything mark does it's awesome 
Batman the Dark Age is out on March 26, 2024. So, so grab your copies, go into the comic book store. Six issues. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you.